Okay, so yesterday we talked about max flow Minkat, right? So, you know, you have some sort of network, you have capacities on the arcs, you want to find the maximum flow from S to T. <coughs> and uh, last time we proved that the max flow equals the min cut, right? But we didn't address, like, you know, if you're given one of these problems, you're actually, you know, somebody actually hands it to you and says, find the max flow. We didn't come up with any algorithms yet for actually finding <coughs> the flow. So <coughs> today we're going to talk about something called the Ford Fulker Fulkerson algorithm, which, yeah, if you're given one of these problems, this will allow you to actually find the flow, the max flow. <coughs> so, and, uh, and yeah, this, it's a kind of, it's a relatively simple algorithm. This, so this is something you should definitely, you know, learn and practice how to do this algorithm. It's something that could very easily show up on the exam, for example. <coughs> and there's exercises which can help you practice. Okay, so, <coughs> so, so basically, I mean, so you want to find the max flow. You may as well, so the, the, the key thing here is going to be, it's, we're going to kind of iteratively increase the flow, you know, kind of step by step until we get to a maximum. So, so you're going to... Increase the flow, <coughs> kind of, you know, by iterating, well, let me just say, iteratively, until it's maximum. <coughs> okay. And the, the, the way that you know that it's maximum is that you find a cut which has the same capacity as the flow. That's what the max flow min cuts. <coughs> okay, so how... How we're going to increase the flow is using something that I'll call the flow augmentation algorithm. Okay, and this is going to be the main, this is the really where all the meat is in this, this algorithm, right? So, the, so basically the whole max flow algorithm is going to be, you know, the, the algorithm is going to be start with a zero flow and then keep applying this augmentation algorithm. <coughs> okay, so... So this algorithm has an the input is a digraph. So this time, so you may you might remember yesterday we we were always talking about multi-digraphs where an arc can appear multiple times. We don't actually so we can now just focus on digraphs because if you think about it, if you have some arc appearing multiple times with different capacities, you can replace it by one arc where you just add up all those capacities. It's like if you have two roads between, you know, that are kind of doing, going the exact same, between the exact same two places, kind of the number of cars that can go between those places is like, you just add up those. It's the same as replacing it by one road. So, so today we're not going to, we're not going to be dealing with multi-digraphs, just digraphs. It was just convenient yesterday for proving the theorem. And so we have a digraph D and a capacity function. C. So again, the capacity function maps every arc to a positive number. And so, we're, so this is going to be an algorithm for increasing an existing flow. So whenever you do this algorithm, you already have a flow f. So from a from 0 to infinity. And it's going to be, so it satisfies the conditions. So it's a, it's a flow subject to C. So it, on every arc, <clears throat> the flow is at most the capacity. And remember, you have this other condition with flows that the flow coming into a vertex has to equal the flow coming out of the vertex. This is this Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff condition. And OK, so we want to augment this flow. So we're given this flow. And either we want to, well, either we want to find a better flow. Ah, sorry. I should say, also say, so a digraph, and you also have these, these vertices s and t, s not equal to t. And this is a flow, it's a flow from S to T. Right, so this Kirchhoff condition is satisfied everywhere except for S and T. But this is, this is the same setup we had yesterday, so it should be familiar. Okay, so, so if you're given this flow, either you want, to, you, know, you want to run this algorithm, you want to say either, okay, here's a bigger flow, right, that would be a good outcome. Or you want to, alternatively, you want to say, here's a reason there doesn't exist a bigger flow. And the reason, of course, the only possible reason is that you find a small capacity cut. So, so the output is either a flow, let's say f prime from s to t, such that the value of f prime is bigger than the value of f. 
Remember, the value is the amount of flow coming out of S, or equivalently, it's the amount of flow coming into T. Or you want to find a reason why that can't exist, exist or a ST cut <coughs> UW such that um, the capacity of UW equals the value of F. And that would tell you that there's no possible way to improve the, the flow that you have. This is actually a kind of clever algorithm. I like this one. Uh, before, we, before I present the algorithm, though, I, may, I need to make one. OK, maybe I'll, I'll write it over here. So one, uh, OK, I'm going to erase it. I just want to make one technical point, which doesn't change anything, really. But it makes the algorithm a bit easier to implement and not make mistakes, basically. So <coughs> the technical point. So we assume, we're going to assume that the digraph D doesn't contain both arcs like UV and VU for any pair of vertices. Okay, because, okay, so, so the picture is like, you know, we don't want the digraph to contain anything, anything like this. But this actually doesn't technically change the problem at all, right? Because so if you were given a digraph that contains a bunch of these, so this, so, so what you can do is you can always replace you know, this picture by basically, you, know, you can take these two arcs, and you can just insert an extra vertex in each of them. Oh, whatever. Right? You can replace them by two different arcs where you, you stick a vertex in between them. And it, if you just pick the capacity here, so suppose this was capacity 5, you make both of these capacity 5. And if this was capacity 3, you make both of these capacity 3. So every time you see one of these, you can always eliminate it by inserting extra vertices. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not going to change the, the max flow at all. Because basically, I mean, yeah, your capacity, it, it's like kind of like you have some pipe that can send 5 liters of water per hour. OK, that's not very Five liters of water per second or something. And I just put some sort of junction in the middle of it. But, it can, but on both sides, you can also, you can again send five liters per second. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, really, it's really not any different. OK, right, so we, we're given a flow, and we want to increase it. Now, there's one really s straightforward way that you could increase the flow. OK, if, you, if you're thinking, how is this algorithm going to work, right? If I take, if I find, if I look at my you know, S and T, so let's consider this example. So, so here we've got all the capacities are three, just to make our life. So I'm going to look at this example first. OK, so there's one glaring way that you can increase this flow. right? I've, I've got S here, I've got T here. Well, if you look along this path, I mean, you've got a, a whole path going from S to T where everything is below the max capacity. right? So if, I just, if, I just, if there is some sort of path going from S to T where none of those arcs are at max capacity, I just increase them. right? I, I would, in this picture, Life is pretty easy. I just change this 1 to a 3. I change this 1 to a 3. It's going to satisfy this Kirchhoff condition, flow in equals flow out, as long as I increase these by the same amount. And, and you're going to be happy. So that, that, was, that was too easy. So it's not, life is not always that easy. So for example, you, know, you could be in this situation. And now if I look from S to T, I look on any path, there's always some arc. Like So these ones are at max capacity. So there's no way you can just easily increase everything along some path. But, but also, this is not a max flow. So we have to do something else in this case. So here what you can do, for example, well, so I, I can't increase this, this arc. I would like to increase this one. Let's say I want to increase it to 2. But now I'm in bad shape on this vertex because he has flow 4 coming in and 3 coming out. So he's, he's got you know, this, this one violating the condition. And I can't increase this, this arc, but I can decrease this one. So sometimes you're going to want to increase, sometimes you're going to want to decrease. And now I look at this one, it has flow of 3 coming in and 2 coming out. That looks bad. But then I can increase this one, and now we're happy. So, so, because, this, so, so because this one had flow which was positive, I can, when I increase this one, I can decrease any positive flow, right? And you can, increase, you can increase flow if it's not at max capacity. You can decrease flow if it's not uh, at 0. And those are the two. So there's two sort of things that we're going to alternate in this proof. Sometimes you want to increase flow somewhere, but sometimes it's actually better to, dec to decrease it so that you can increase it somewhere else. 
hopefully that's not too confusing. But, but these, I think these two examples sort of show the two ways that you can do things. Okay, so how do we make this formal? Any questions about anything so far? Okay. Okay, so, so we're going to, so this is, we have this input and we're going to try to find a better flow or a small cut. Okay, so, so here's the algorithm. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to build uh, an auxiliary digraph, so a, a different digraph. So we construct <coughs> an auxiliary digraph. Auxiliary, what I mean by auxiliary is just, it's like a kind of temporary digraph that we're going to use to solve the problem, but it's not, it's not something that you, you really care to, it's just going to be used for this problem. But anyway, so we, bu we build an auxiliary digraph. We're currently gonna call it DF. So it's a digraph depending on flow F, where if you have, so if you look at any arc in the original digraph, so we include the arc UV in DF, if the flow on that arc, okay, hopefully this, this notation is clear, right? So the flow on that arc, if the flow is less than the capacity, then we draw that arc in DF. So the ones that are, are the ones that are tight to their capacity, we're not gonna draw. And here's the, here's the, the kind of, the thing which I'm illustrating in this picture. So we include the arc BU, so this is the reverse of the, the original one in DF. If F of UV, the flow on UV is positive. So in particular, you know, so in DF, we may include both UV and VU you know, if if it's the case that the flow is both, you know, is somewhere between zero, like positive, and it's less than the capacity. So in particular, so remember we, for, for the digraph D, we have this property, you don't have these, you know, arc going this way, arc going that way, but in DF, you do. You have lots of these double arcs, or this way and that way. But basically, you know, the idea here is, is kind of, I mean, what we're, we're looking at here is, is the same sort of thing I was illustrating in that picture. So. So what I want to do now is I want to see if there's a path from S to T in DF, right? If there's a path from S to T in DF, well, whenever we use these kinds of edges, right, or these kind of arcs, this always has some room to increase the, the flow. And when we use one of these arcs, you have room to decrease the flow without going to negative number. And, and like we showed in this picture, sometimes you want to increase the flow on an arc, sometimes you want to decrease it so that you can increase it. And this, this is really captured by this uh, construction. Is there anything unclear about the definition? Any question? Okay, so the second step is to determine whether there exists an S to, so a path from S to T in DF, which we can do fairly quickly. Right, we, we are, we've already seen some algorithms for this. Well, I mean, it, it's really easy, right? You just kind of start with S, you look at its, the arcs coming out of it, include those vertices, and you just keep looking at, looking out and out and out from all the vertices you've seen. And if you reach T at some point, you found the path. If you don't reach T, then you don't find the path. So, okay, so, so first we're gonna look at, you know, suppose there is a path, and I'm gonna use this to increase the flow, so. So case one, suppose the path exists. So for each arc x, y on, the, on that path, define, so I'm gonna call it sigma of x, y. So this is gonna be basically the amount that I'm, I can either increase the flow on that arc or decrease it, or sorry, or decrease it on the opposite arc. So this is gonna be equal to the capacity of, so it's kind of conditional depending on whether this arc is actually in the digraph or whether it's reverse in the digraph. <clears throat> so, so sigma of xy is the capacity, I think my c's look like print, 
my parentheses and the c's look almost the same. This is c of open parentheses, open, anyway, the c of xy minus f of xy if xy is in A. So A is, remember, that's the arc set of the original digraph. And we just set it equal to f of yx if the reverse yx is in A. Because by construction, for every arc in, in DF, either that arc was present in D or the opposite one was present, or both. Is this, is the construct, the definition clear? So this is kind of telling me how much I can increase or decrease this, this arc without screwing things up. Okay, now I let, okay, so let alpha be the minimum over all of these sigma xy's, so such that xy is in the path. And by construction, so by construction of df, we know that alpha is positive. There's always, you know, there's always at least some gap either, yeah, so if, if xy is in the, in, in the digraph, then, it, the, then there's some sort of gap, right? There's some, you can still increase the flow on that arc, and if yx is in the digraph, then there's some room to decrease the, the flow on that arc, right? So this is always positive. And now we find a new flow, f prime, by increasing the flow on xy by alpha for all xy in the path, well, xy, which is in A on the path, decreasing, so decreasing the flow on yx for all uh, xy not in A on the path. Oh, de decreasing this by alpha. And by the way we've done things, you know, we're going to, this, so f prime is going to be, it's a valid flow, subject. So valid means, you know, it has this Kirchhoff condition. And you can see that it's going to be bounded by C because we haven't, yeah. The only time we increased, we increased by a small amount, which wasn't going to violate. Any questions about that part of the algorithm? Okay, so that's kind of case one. So, so here we're assuming that there is a path from S to T, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, aha, very good. X, Y, not in A, such that, yeah. It's, yeah, sometimes confusing which, which one am I talking about, X, Y, or Y, X. But I, I mean that such that Y, X is on the path. Sorry. No, 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 uh, no, I think it was right before. So, okay, but maybe, maybe I need to, exp I've written things maybe a bit too short here. So, so I'm going to decrease F of Y, X by alpha, yeah, for all. Oh, so this, this x, y, when I write it's not in the arc in a, in a, I mean it's not an arc of the original digraph D. It is an arc of DF, right? Because so every, so, so yeah, so this is, this is an arc of, of DF, which is not in D. That means it's, it's kind of the, re remember we, we put in these arcs which are kind of reverses of, of some of the arcs in our original digraph. So yeah, so there were, so if, if x, y is not in A, but it's an arc of df, that means that the backwards version of it, x, uh, y, x, was an arc of, so if you go through the, if you go through the construction, and, and here we're kind of implicitly using this technical, technical uh, condition that the original digraph didn't have both of these arcs, because then it'll be confusing. You have to keep track of, there's gonna be like four arc, there could be potentially four different arcs on the same thing, but yeah. But this, this simplifies things. But yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, the second case is that the path doesn't exist. Okay, hopefully that's clear what I'm writing. The path, there isn't a path from S to T in DF. So now we want to find a small cut. So, but this is actually not going to be hard. Basically the cut is going to come from taking, so I'm going to let U be the set of all V such that there exists a path from S to V in DF. In particular, this is going to include S because, okay, if I just start it, I mean, if you, a one vertex path is still a path. Okay. And W is V minus U. And because we know that the path doesn't exist, we know that S is in U and T is in W. And of course, 
they're dis disjoint. So they're, they partition the vertices. They're disjoint in the union. So this is a cut. And, <coughs> okay, so actually picture is probably good. <laughs> so, so this is my set U, it contains the vertex S. This is my set W, it contains the vertex T. And presumably, you know, in the digraph D, so, so this picture is going to be the digraph D, presumably there were some arcs, right, going from here to here, probably, right? And there were some arcs coming from here to here. So what do we know about those arcs, given the fact, so, so we know that in DF, there's no path going from, in fact, in DF we know that there's simply, by definition of U and W, there's simply no arc going this way. Right? Because if there was a single arc going from this set to this set, I would, well, you know, there, there exists some path going to this vertex from S, right? And then I would just hop on that edge and find a path going to this vertex, contradiction, right? So there simply are no arcs going this way. All arcs come this way. What does that mean for this arc, for example? It means it has to be at full capacity because any arc of the original digraph which isn't at full capacity will still exist in DF. If there's, so any arc not at full capacity, it would exist here, but we know that there aren't any going this way in DF. What we know is that this one's at you know, full capacity, this one's at full capacity. And what do we know about this arc? Well, if its value, if, if the flow on that arc wasn't zero, then we would have, you know, by definition of DF, DF would contain the backwards version of that arc. So this one must be at, uh, this one must have flow zero. Otherwise, by construction, we would include the backwards version of it. And this one must be at flow zero. <clears throat> Is that clear? Because otherwise we would just, yeah, it would contradict the choice of U and W. Okay, here's the, the kicker. Well, here's the, the last line of the proof, basically. Or the, la yeah, the last line of the algorithm. Well, so it's not hard to see that, and, and this can be proved just by kind of doing this calculation we did yesterday when we were showing that max flows at most min cut. So perhaps I, I won't go through the details of this again, but uh, so the value of f is going to be equal to the sum over all arcs a from u to w f of a. <clears throat> okay. So this, <clears throat> this is something, perhaps, which requires an argument, right? Similar to the proof that uh, max flow is at most min cut. So the, this algebraic al argument I gave yesterday, where we had a bunch of sums, things canceled, and we had we got the end. So, so I'm not going to go through the details of that, but, but, uh, but it's not hard. So the value of f is going to be equal, you know, exactly to this, which, <clears throat> well, in this picture, we, we, we now know what the flow across is. We can just calculate it in terms of the capacities, because every arc a from u to w has full flow, like the flow equals the capacity. Ah, sorry, this, sorry, I did mess this up. So I should be subtracting here the arcs A from, U to, from W to U. You'll see why it's easy to forget that because these are all zero, right? But yeah, so by the picture above, so all of these flows are equal to their capacity. All of these flows are zero, so this equals just the sum of the capacities from, A, from U to W, which is which is equal to the capacity of UW. So therefore, you know, the, the flow, the value of F equals the capacity of UW, and that implies F must be a max flow. Because you simply can't find a flow bigger than the capacity of a cut. It's impossible. Any questions about that? Apologies for not doing the details of this, but it's really the same calculation I did last. I know that calculation was possibly confusing, but yeah, that's, that is it. Oh, also, I probably should have mentioned earlier, everything, all of this stuff that I've just done is in section 4.3 of the Shriver notes. 
And I, I'm presenting all the algorithms the exact same way. So that's a reference in case you want to read some. Okay, so this was, this was the augmentation, flow augmentation algorithm. So given a flow, this will find a bigger flow or show that one doesn't exist. But this is, this is the, you know, the main part of the algorithm for finding a max flow because, well, so the, the Ford Fulkerson algorithm for the max flow basically just says, you know, So this is the Ford Fulkerson max flow algorithm. So initialize, you know, your flow to just be, well, a very boring flow where everything just equals zero. And then repeat the augmentation algorithm until it's max, until you end up with a max Low. Let's keep doing it, doing it, doing it, and until you get a max. Now, remember, I mean, in this module, we're supposed to be like, you know, we're not just interested in algorithms that can solve problems. Usually that's pretty easy because you can just, okay, in this case, it's, it's in fact not so obvious what you would do to solve this problem with a, with a not clever algorithm. But in most of the problems, if you just do something not very clever, you can usually solve the problems. But we're interested in doing it quickly, right? So, so you might wonder what is the, uh, how fast is, it, is this algorithm? And in this case, actually, we have some bad news. This algorithm is actually pretty slow. In fact, in some cases, it's as slow as, it could, as you could possibly imagine, which means it can run infinitely long. It, can, it could never stop. So, so if the capacities, so that sounds like bad news, right? So if, if the capacities are irrational and kind of cleverly chosen and you don't do things carefully, let's say, this may never actually find the max flow. You might just increase the flow over and over forever, so. And one of the exercises is, is to show this, to give an example where this thing would run forever. Um, but, so, so one thing is, so, okay, so, so two things to say about this are that you can do things more carefully so that it runs in polynomial time, and that if the capacities are rational, then it will always end. Okay, but it might take a long time to, to finish, but it will always finish. So, so we're not going to look at the more careful algorithm, so you're not going to have to worry about that, but it's just useful to know that if, well, by being more careful, you can get a polynomial time algorithm by basically just adjusting this algorithm in some way. Okay, but we're, we're not going to cover that. Um, and so here's a, a theorem. So if the capacities are rational, then the algorithm terminates. So it doesn't run for, forever. That might not sound, I mean, it's not that uh, encouraging news though, obviously. If it, if we just know the algorithm terminates, I mean, it might still take a really long time, but at least you know you will find the answer eventually. And the proof is basically, it's basically, you know, I mean, the point is if you, if you have rational um, capacities, then you sort of know that this value alpha, that, so alpha, remember, that's the, the amount you kind of shift, you increase or decrease each arc. You know this, this value alpha is not gonna be, you sort of know what it's going to be in some sense. Well, you know, you can bound it, so. Uh, so if you just let m be the least common multiple of the denominators of the capacities, hopefully it's clear what I mean by this. Like, if you write the capacities as a rational number, integer divided by integer, right? Just take all the denominators, de denominators let's say, let's say you write that in, I don't know, so that they have their co-prime or something. Take all those de denominators, Take the least common multiple, and it's not hard to see that alpha will always be, if you just analyze this algorithm, an integer multiple of 1 over m. And, and so therefore, the value, uh, that's one thing I didn't mention in, in this uh, algorithm, right? But, but it should be clear that when I did this augmentation, the value increased by exactly alpha. 
And the, so the value increases by at least 1 over m in each iteration. But then it can only increase finitely many times because eventually you'll hit the value of your uh, min cut. So after a certain number of iterations, so eventually you hit the, uh, the capacity because you're always increasing by at least 1 over m. You can only do that finitely many times until you hit the value so, uh, of the min cut. And that completes the proof. So eventually, it will stop. However, if these things are irrational, then you can't really bound below you know, the, 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 the value of alpha. So it may, it may get, get stuck. And, well, not get stuck, but it may just loop forever.